Greetings from Toronto. A warm welcome to all of you joining us today from Canada, Nigeria, and beyond. My name is Dr. Uche Ungwaba. I am an assistant professor at the Lincoln Alexander School of Law at Toronto Metropolitan University. Today, we are so pleased to bring together key experts from the legal profession for a webinar to explore the future of Nigeria's justice system. The law school is proud to host this special event in collaboration with Massfield LP, a future focused law practice with offices in Nigeria, Canada, and South Korea. Over the next two hours, we will host two dynamic conversations where we will take a deeper dive into various themes related to Nigeria's judiciary, including efficiency, autonomy, governance, funding, technology, legal training and education, and most importantly, access to justice. I would like to mention that live captioning of this event is available for participants and it's embedded within Zoom. We will also post a link in the chat for easy access. Before we officially begin, it is important that we recognize the land on which the Lincoln Alexander School of Law operates. Toronto is in the dish with one spoon territory. The dish with one spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent indigenous nations and peoples, European settlers and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. Today, this meeting, this meeting place is still home to many indigenous peoples, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Thank you. As many of you know, Nigeria's justice system has witnessed its fair share of some of the instability that has faced Nigeria as a country over the years. In this sense, the administration of justice is challenged by inefficiencies that impact access to justice for litigants on the one hand, and a crisis of governance involving operators of the justice system on the other. In responding to these issues, we've put together two back-to-back -to -back panel discussions to explore two sub-themes, efficiency and access to justice, this panel, and immediately following, operators of the justice system. Both panel discussions will include a short segment for audience question and answer. We encourage you to submit your questions at any point using the Q&A feature on Zoom. We may not have the time to answer all of your questions, but we will do our best. I will now invite my distinguished lineup of panelists to join me for the panel discussions, inviting them in alphabetical order. I would first like to invite Mrs. Laura Alakija. Mrs. Alakija is the managing partner of Primera Africa Legal, a top commercial law firm in Nigeria. I would also like to invite the Honorable Dr. Chili Ebo Osuji. Dr. Ebo Osuji is distinguished international jurist and special advisor to the president's office. He recently completed his term as president of the International Criminal Court. The third panelist I'll be inviting is Leonard Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Chief Anthony Ikemefuna Idigbe. Chief Idigbe holds a doctorate degree from Osgoode Hall Law School and is the senior partner at Punuka Attorneys and Solicitors. Finally, I would like to invite Ms. Osai Ojigo. Ms. Ojigo is currently the country director of Amnesty International Nigeria. She is also a civil society leader with extensive experience working in the African human rights system. A warm welcome to all my panelists. In moderating this panel, I will give each panelist five minutes to make their opening intervention, after which we will engage in an interactive discussion where I will be posing questions to our panelists 
including questions that have been submitted by members of the audience. I would now like to invite Chief Idibe for his opening intervention. Thank you um, very much, uh, Uche. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. Um, let me just talk about the uh, social contract theory, uh, which postulates a limited role for government in the protection of life and property. Thomas Hobbes argues that the social contract involves the people exchanging their agency for violence in return for protection by the government. One of those uh, government obligations is justice delivery. In classic uh, Leviathan and Hobbesian theories, the monarch exercises supreme authority, authority via the social contract, including delivering justice directly or through advisors, now the courts. Montesk observed that such absolute power corrupts and suggested separation of powers with checks and balances. Judicial independence concepts seek further to insulate the judiciary from other arms of government, thereby ensuring more effective protection for the people. I examined the history of court governance in Nigeria in stages of um, colonial, post-colonial, military rule, the federal structure, and transition to civil rule. During the colonial era, the judges were appointed by the colonial government. The common law governance system was imposed with amendments to suit the colonial agenda. For instance, strict separation of powers was not always practiced during the colonial regime. Also, a local legal profession was not encouraged. Lawyers had to qualify in the UK, and a law school was only established post-independence. The regulation of the profession was held tightly by the colonial government through control of institutions like the General Council of Bar, a situation that remains to, uh, to date. Now, as independence approached, the government opened the appointment of judges to the indigenous lawyers, choosing the best who were willing to take up the appointment. Further, the emoluments were competitive and tenure secure. Now, civilian rule was unfortunately interrupted by military intervention in 1966. The executive and legislative arms of government were abolished. Only the judiciary survived, but was bruised and ignored by the military, including by the passage of a decree declaring that it was supreme and not subject to the authority of the court. The military engaged in various experiments of political structure and return to civil rule, including the abolition of regions, creation of states, and two-level civilian and military governments. Eventually, the civilian government stabilized after several stumbles. Political contestation was vicious, even among the civilian uh, parties. The uh, perception of abuse of checks and balances and lack of financial and political independence or security of tenure, which climaxed during military government, persisted during the early stages of civilian rule. There was an inability to attract the best talents from the, pro from the profession. The Justice Carradier Shaw Panel was instituted to investigate the causes of the decline in the judiciary and recommend solutions. A key recommendation was the centralization of the appointment and discipline process. The Shaw Panel also recommended the creation of a national judicial council to recommend all appointments at both federal and state levels, as well as discipline of judges. The composition of the council was to insulate it and the judges from interference from the executive arm of government. Unfortunately, the NGC and its sister institution, the Federal Judicial Service Commission, became an albatross in the governance of the courts. The composition of the NGC had thrown absolute separation of power. It had an all judiciary membership. The Chief Justice of Nigeria chairs it and practically every other important judicial institution and appoints all non-judiciary members. Yet the NJC is situated in the executive chapter of the constitution. The inclusion of the NJC in the constitution as a super institution means no ability to amend or restructure it. Consequently, there is a constant resort to unconventional means of intervention by the executive, such as raid of um, the courts or the judges, uh, use of code of conduct. And even recently, the judiciary itself had to use uh, unconventional means to get out uh, the um, CJN. Another weakness in the governance structure is the multiplicity of regulators and the existence of regulatory capture. I refer to the 2017 report of the MBA committee, the Legal Profession Regulatory Review Committee. 
Further, there is inconsistent jurisprudence on judicial uh, governance. For instance, in Nganjiwa against FRN, it was held that only the NJC can deal with corruption charges and a judge in active service cannot be investigated or tried in a court of law unless such a judge is first removed from the bench. But contra uh, the case of Onodian, where a former CJN was tried before the Code of Conduct Tribunal, YSA was in office. So some of the consequences of the weaknesses in the governance structure include nepotism, cultism, uh, corruption, promotion mentality within the judiciary, exclusion of career commingling at the top echelon of the uh, judiciary, inability and lack of willingness to attract the best to the judiciary consistently, poor management of the justice delivery system, delay in justice delivery, decline in quality of judgments and ju justice obtainable, increase in resort to suffer by the citizens, rise of non-state supported alternative justice systems such as OPC, Bakasa Boys, uh, Bakasi Boys, Hessmen, et cetera, breakdown of rule of law and prevalence of impunity. Now, uh, are there remedial tools available for rescuing the judiciary and guaranteeing the, fu the future of the institution? I think there are, but it may involve constitutional amendment. It may also involve uh, the implementation of the MBA recommendations and the draft bill for reform of the legal profession. And it may require immediate government action to protect the welfare of the people by stemming the, ted, the tide towards impunity and break down a rule of law through massive financial and administrative intervention in the judiciary, the type we saw in Singapore or uh, Kenya. Uh, now, are there impediments to implementation or reform? Yes, there are entrenched interests, there's legal constraint, there's lack of leadership and vision. In concluding, I would say that because the governance structure has a correlationship with the people that will be attracted to the judiciary and their level of accountability and the output of the justice delivery system, and these have an impact on the overriding objective of enthroning the rule of law rather than the survival of the fit fittest, there is a need for a mind change among the various arms of government and the realization that justice delivery is a social good that should be cooperatively delivered by them whilst respecting judicial independence. I think that the judiciary must self-innovate and transform itself to remain relevant in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very uh, deep history about the judiciary in Nigeria. I will now turn to you, uh, the Honorable Chile Ebo Osuji for your opening intervention. Could you unmute yourself, please? Thank you very much, um, Professor Nguba. It's an honor to, to be amongst this distinguished panel. Um, I will uh, take it from that philosophical and historical perspectives that Chief Idebe gave and, and bring it um, home to a certain um to certain brass tags and i come at it from this perspective i as you know i i uh, practiced law in nigeria in canada and also on international stage before um sitting as a judge and the icc and then from that perspective i come at this you know, discussion uh the panel here is efficiency and access to justice panel and when we talk about access to justice we are of course talking about the people's access to justice and just what justice means for the people um Jiffy Dibbit has given us some very important historical background and philosophical premise um, from uh, the Hobbesian um, theory to Montesquieu now this one, in terms of meat and potatoes, appreciation of what justice does for the people, and especially from the perspective of the, the, the focus I want to give, which is proper funding of the judiciary, including proper adequate remuneration of judges in terms of salary and pension. Let me bring in uh, the views of somebody everybody knows about, Adam Smith, uh, the uh, father of political, the theory of political economy. He wrote that book in 1776 in, in, entitled The Wealth of Nations for short. In it, he examined the different 
factors that contribute to the economy of uh, a nation. He gave different, you know, factors, and but then he he comes down to this. He said, above all, above all, he said, uh, the, there's nothing that gives greater uh, encouragement and most effectual encouragement to all sorts of industry, and remember here, all sorts of industry, than the administration of justice. It brings it in. So whatever you do, after all said and done, there's nothing that gives the greatest encouragement and most effectual encouragement to administration of uh, uh, to, to the economy, uh, uh, to all sorts of industry than the administration of justice. And he continued to say that it is for that reason that uh, proper funding of the administration of justice is something that must be done for the benefit of society as a whole. And I would again move it to the access of people to justice. Uh, the proper funding of the judiciary uh, requires judges to be paid adequately and that pension secured adequately. It is for the good of the people that this must be done. Why? Uh, the Canadian Supreme Court answered that question in 1997 in a case called reference um, remuneration of judges of Prince Edward Island. In that case, the court situated the idea of proper or adequate remuneration and pension of judges in the as a constitutional question. And that is uh, section 11 D of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms that guarantees persons accused of crimes to a fair hearing before a court that is independent and impartial. The emphasis there is independent and impartial. So it was seen as a constitutional matter for judges to be remunerated well. Now you move from there, of course, that authority I recommend is persuasive authority for the Nigerian legal system. The parallel to Article, uh, sorry, Section 11D of the Canadian Constitution or Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedom is what? Uh, Section 36.1 of the Nigerian Constitution, in fact, makes that similar provision in a more robust and direct way. Uh, the Canadian version uh, situated in the context of a, a criminal trial. But Niger the Nigerian Constitution Article 36.1 actually talks about in any suit before a court or a tribunal, uh, the persons or Nigerians have the right to a fair trial before a court or tribunal that is uh, so, uh, that must be independent and impartial. So whenever you see the concept of uh, independent or requirement of independent and impartial uh, a tribunal, therein you look for uh, the independent judiciary, the right to judicial independence, and a critical factor in the judicial independence of uh, a system is actually economic security of the judges, economic security, so as to uh, protect them from the uh, vulnerabilities that uh, they're exposed to when salaries and pensions are inadequate. So that is why you look at it, and this is consistent with international uh, standards. There are different instruments that speak to that. UN basic principles on independence of judiciary. A universal declaration of the independence of judges, we call that the Montreal Declaration of 1983. The International Bar Association Minimum Standards of Judicial Independence, that is Clause 14. Uh, Commonwealth Latimer House Principles, uh, that also speak to this. You speak about the Commonwealth Compendium of Best Practices, you look at pages 73 to 78 of that instrument. 
which am I? It's yes. my time up. All yes. right. So I'll okay. leave it there and then I'll probably say more during question time. I must Thank respect your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I will now invite um, uh, Ms. Alakeje for your intervention. Right, thank you very much, Uche. And uh, I am delighted and relieved to be speaking after Chief DBSAN and Chief Ebo Suji as well, because they have uh, pretty much laid a good foundation that I can build on. And I'll be speaking from the perspective of uh, the application or the use of technology in the justice delivery system. Uh, in Nigeria. And to sort of put things in perspective, I will tell a few personal stories to sort of clarify my intervention. Um, I remember when I got admission to study law at the University of Joss, one of the first things that the Law Student Society at the time did was to try to introduce uh, first year students to uh, the justice system. So they took us to the correctional facilities and to the high court. And when we got to the high courts, they had structured it such that uh, we met a trial in progress and counsel was cross-examining a witness. And I remember, you know, walking in very excited and thinking I'm about to experience a matlock moment. But I found very quickly that, uh, you know, the counsel would ask his question, then uh, the witness would say one line and then counsel will ask him to hold on. And then he'd wait a moment and then say another line and counsel would. So I whispered to the senior sitting beside me, what's going on? Why can't he just answer the question? And the senior said to me that, oh, the judge has to write everything uh, longhand. So we have to wait for the judge to sort of catch up uh, with the witness testimony uh, in order to be able to conclude uh, his record of proceedings. Uh, fast forward a few years later, when I joined the legal market, my first job was uh, in the legal services sector working for publishing house uh, and at the time what we were i was working at the uh, electronic and digital resources department so at the time what we were doing was essentially deploying digital legal resources to uh institutions courts and law firms so sort of across the whole uh legal services sector and you know um at each point in time, we had to train students or lecturers for institutions, judges in the courts. And uh, when we went to law firms to train legal practitioners, just sort of introduce um, electronic technology in general to the legal services sector. And um, some of the pilot projects we tried to do at the time uh, was apart from uh, establishing digital libraries in those places, um, was digitalizing the records of the course of appeal at the time. And I remember that we had to uh, take all the physical records of a court. If you know how the physical records are stored, you know that they're typed and then they're, they're pasted in this booklet and they're stored according to each case. And so the first thing we had to do is to get high-speed scanners that would scan those judgments about 100 pages per minute, then train uh, judicial, uh, staff of the courts how to use those scanners, how to scan the material, then convert them to like, um, uh, documents that you could then upload to a digital database that we had created for the courts so that it will make it easy to retrieve the cases. Once that was done, then we had to train the judges and the legal officers and their legal assistants or research assistants, you know, to use that. And we sort of uploaded that data and the courts began to use it. And I thought that with that intervention that, you know, most other courts in Nigeria would sort of follow suit and it would just, you know, be a wave of technology sweeping across uh, the whole nation. Um, I'm, I'm not excited to say that that hasn't quite happened yet, but you know, the process is ongoing. But my point is um, in terms of justice delivery, we've, we've looked at the historical perspective and we've seen uh, the interventions that the government should make. Um, we've also seen, uh, um, we've also had, had some conversation about what the legal framework should be. And my intervention is, you know, in order to, to, to facilitate justice delivery in Nigeria, some of the other things we need to look at are one, infrastructure and two, manpower. And, you know, those are the two areas where we still have a lot of gaps. Um, three weeks ago, somebody called me with an SOS to 
on behalf of someone who had been convicted uh, of murder and sentenced to death by hanging. And after a lot of back and forth, my firm decided to take up that case pro bono. And so we sent a lawyer to that state to sort of get the records of proceedings and file the notice of appeal. And up until the date when we were ready to sort of reconcile records so that we will proceed for the, with the appeal in that matter, the records of proceedings were not ready because they were still typing out what the judge had sort of put down longhand. So the records of proceedings were not ready, even though everything else was available and we were ready to proceed with the appeal. So to that extent, you can see that we still have gaps in terms of technology, in terms of the infrastructure, obviously, even in terms of the legal framework. I think the pandemic sort of showed that uh, very clearly when the pandemic hit. Uh, at the time, um, you know, there were a lot of arguments back and forth about whether Nigeria could constitutionally, whether we could hold virtual hearings or not. So the CJN immediately set up, you know, uh, the CJN at the time, yes, immediately set up, you know, uh, virtual hearing uh, facilities at the Federal High Court. The Attorney General of the Federation at the time also set up virtual hearing facilities at Kujie Correctional Facility so that, you know, around the country, we could start to, uh, take advantage of technology in our justice delivery because the pandemic brought everything to a grinding halt. And then shortly after that, the matter was in court and what lawyers were, were, were trying to determine was the constitutionality of virtual hearings. Because then there was a section of the constitution and I'm glad uh, uh, Chief Ebo Suji mentioned it earlier, section 36 of the constitution provided that uh, uh, especially in criminal cases, that hearings should be public. The public should be able to, and then there was argument back and forth. Gratefully, the Supreme Court held that, you know, it was not unconstitutional to hold virtual hearings. So from, from my perspective, these are the sorts of challenges that we have to deal with and maybe overcome in order to be able to use uh, technology to fast track or to facilitate justice delivery. And it's not just the court system so that uh, the, the information is not incomplete. It's not just the court system. Apart from the courts, every aspect of our justice delivery system is lagging behind when it comes to technology. Uh, if you look at the law enforcement agencies, a lot of things are still done physically and by hand, not enough records that you can access and process uh, to be able to deliver justice at the speed and at the pace that is required for the 21st century. I think Uche is trying to tell me that my time is up. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very That's much. That's fine. I'm, I'm happy to go into details during the Q&A. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, I'll now invite uh, Ms. Ojigo for your intervention. Uh, thank you very much. I'm really happy to be joining this conversation today. Uh, without much ado, uh, let me just start by saying that, um, and I, I also want to appreciate my co-panelists for really establishing the grounds in terms of what access to justice uh, should be. Uh, I've been asked to speak on the issue of simplification and modernization of access to justice. Uh, but I wanted to just stress right now, after listening to uh, those who have spoken ahead of me, that when we think of access to justice, we often tend to focus on uh, the procedural, right? Especially if we are dealing with legal folks. But access to justice has both the substantive as well as uh, the procedural elements. And it depends on how this is couched in order to, and how it's reflected to those who use uh, the justice system. Uh, the other thing is for us, it's about getting effective access to justice. So even if it's simplified, it's modernized, if it's not effective, and if it's not working to ensure that people's rights are protected within the system, uh, people have equality in order to be able to approach the courts and get justice within the court system, for example, then uh, the modernity that we seek has to be one that is enshrined and is um, entrenched on human rights standards, but particularly around non-discrimination and um, equality. So um, in terms of some of the things that have been shared already, uh, the fact that cases take a very long time to be decided in our courts is a major factor. And like the previous speaker has already spoken about 
doc, um, about judges writing in longhand and about how slowly we're getting to this point of getting justice to be speeded up in terms of uh, responses to violations and issues that um, claimants have and even defendants have uh, in terms of pursuing justice. But I also like to emphasize the point in terms of how those who use the system, especially uh, victims, uh, survivors, their family members, how they understand the justice system, how alienated they feel, the fact that they sometimes really understand what even on the numerous processes that we do as lawyers um, in the court is also a key if we are going to be able to make it more um, understandable and accessible for people who are non-lawyers and who are genuinely terrified to be facing um, a judge, facing people that are knowledgeable um, and have all the resources that they need in order to uh, represent the needs of justice. And also the fact that oftentimes the courts, which are supposed to be the last hope for the common person, is also being seen as a tool of oppression in the sense that if you the, the kind of legal advice and the kind of legal representation you get will determine the kind of justice that you also receive. And we've seen this happen a lot in criminal cases when people are charged for offenses and they cannot afford a lawyer and end up in jail, even to get their appeals done in time, and the quality of legal representation they get compared to someone who has the means, has the political clout and the status in order to have a huge uh, amount of legal resources at their level. So in addressing the issue of simplification and modernization, it is also pertinent that we have a situation whereby it's not so much, yes, um, um, everybody approaching the court should be able to select a lawyer of their own choice, but where they cannot afford it, how do we evolve a legal aid system that is at the touch of a button, people can have access and see the profiles of a number of people that can represent them in cases. And then beyond technology, how do we ensure that we maintain a register of persons within the jurisdiction or the premises of the court that can be assessed without charge to those who need them? Uh, because the final point will not be cost. Uh, the previous speaker has spoken about technology and technology has been um, used as an example uh, of how we can reduce the cost of litigating. But in a country like Nigeria, for example, where infrastructure, electricity, power supply is critical in terms of any technological onboarding you want. You also have the issue of economic, uh, the fact that um, the resources that are allocated for this public service should be uh, provided in a manner that does not exclude the generality of people who cannot afford alternative sources of power in order to access this technology when it is deployed. And I would also want to end my intervention around the classes of people engaging the justice system. So when you have women, children, or people who traditionally have been excluded from society in terms of opportunities, whatever methods we deploy have to definitely take into consideration uh, gender responses, uh, also responses in terms of um, the ages, the status of people engaging in it to ensure that the system that is deployed does not discriminate and provides a level playing field as much as possible for everyone to get that substantive justice as well as to be heard, not only in the court of law, but also loud and clear in society. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you very much uh, for all the intervention from panelists. And uh, this has set the tone for the discussion segments. Um, the first question I will be posing is about governance. Uh, Chief Idigbe, uh, this question is, is for you. In an op-ed published by the cable and online news publication, Professor Chidi Anslem Odinkalu, in discussing the legacy of late Chief Justice of Nigeria, Aloysius Katsina Alo, said the following. Over one decade ago, it was clear 
that the Nigerian Judicial Council has constituted was unsustainable. It was equally clear that the ubiquitous role of the CJN in the complex web of judicial governance in Nigeria did not serve the person, the office, or the institutions of the judiciary well. Kasina Alu, and more recently, Tanko Muhammad, showed how a venal CJN could suborn the NGC, court users, and honest judges in Nigeria deserve better. In your view, uh, Chief Idibe, is there something wrong with the current architecture of governance of Nigeria's justice system? You've hinted at that, but could you sort of uh, build on that a bit? If so, what is wrong with the system and how can it be better positioned for the future? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, you're right. Uh, I hinted on it already. Um, clearly, there are weaknesses in the governance um, structure. As I said, um, if you examine the structure of governance, uh, you look at the NJC, you look at the FJSC, uh, um, you would find that the intention of the Ashore panel was uh, laudable. They were trying to uh, deal with the problem of interference from the executive arm um, uh, at that time. Uh, and then they came up with this idea of centralization, uh, having everything in the uh, uh, NJC, then having only the judges look after themselves, you know, and they thought in their wisdom that that was the best way to do it. Uh, but actually, uh, Montesca's argument uh, of uh, checks and balance is unassailable. And uh, having the absolute separation of power now gave rise to these other uh, problems of cultism, uh, promotion mentality, uh, nepotism, um, uh, etc. There's no accountability. I mean, the CGN is everything in the system, and you can see the pressure points. Um, you then find the um, not just solely the federal government, even state governments, because they do the appointments and um, discipline of even state judges. And there are so many instances today where the NGC has recommended discipline of judges, of state judges, and the governors have refused to, si refused to sign off. So they are technically not judges, but they are still judges because the sign off has not occurred because there's a pushback at the state level, showing that um, the process um, has a challenge. There's, the people don't feel completely involved. The public that we are serving, at the end of the day, justice delivery is for the public. The public is not involved. It, it, at all, in any way, in all these processes. If you look at the reforms that occurred in the UK, it was driven by the Competition Commission saying that the public needed to be involved in the regulation of the legal profession. And so they had to drop all those ideas of um, uh, lawyers ruling themselves, uh, etc., and then brought in the public into the uh, system. So there's need for reform, definitely, in terms of the composition. Um, it's almost like um, an ancestor's relationship that um, has been developed in terms of the governance. And we need to open it up, free it up, get the public more involved, in, have some sort of uh, checks and balances. There's no member of the executive that is a member of the NJC. There is the attorney general in the F, F, um, Federal Judicial Service Commission, but not in the NJC. Um, and so you don't have that uh, cross-pollination which is needed between the arms of government and there's nothing that makes the CJN accountable. So essentially I agree and uh, it's a driver for reform. That's what I would say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the next question I, I have is directed at uh, you, uh, Dr. Ebo Suji, and it's about funding and autonomy. On Friday, 15th July, 2000, uh, 2022, uh, the National Industrial Court of Nigeria in Abuja ordered an increment in the salaries of the Chief Justice of Nigeria and other justices. Uh, the lawyer who filed the suit and secured the verdict was Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Sebast Chief Sebastian Horn, one of the panelists in the second panel. While many have hailed the decision as meaningful for securing the independence of the bench, there are so many critics who have argued that the suggested amount for increment is out of step with economic realities of many Nigerians. Others, such as the Attorney General of the Federation and the 
Minister of Justice, have argued that judges have no legal rights to have their own salaries reviewed upwards. Are you in agreement with the decision of the court? If so, can you succinctly tell us how we should respond to these criticisms of the judgment? Uh, thank you. That's a huge question. I'm going to try my best to deal with it. Um, first of all, um, uh, uh, you, you had the first section of my, um, my comments. I, I, had, um, I was going to speak about this when I agreed to come on this panel, but then a week or two later, uh, the news broke that a uh, judgment had been rendered in a case I did not know was going on, and it was Chief Sebastian Hon uh, that filed it. And I think that um, that development has to be one of the most significant uh, developments in the modern history of administration of uh, justice in Nigeria. And um, I, I don't know what you cited the arguments of the Attorney General. I, I don't know whether this came after the judgment or whether it was an argument he made in in the uh, in the stream of uh, litigation. But let me put it this way: I mentioned the Canadian model now in. Um, I was surprised actually to hear that it was only um, Chief Sebastian Horn that engaged in that litigation. I've been reading now that uh, some lawyers are now uh, applauding the judgment. You know, in Canada, uh, there's a system that resulted from the Supreme Court of Justice, uh, Supreme Court of Canada's judgment of 1997 that I mentioned earlier. That system now required um, an effective, objective, and independent commission that looks at questions of judicial compensation every four years or so uh, in a comprehensive way. And routinely, it is the attorney general or the minister of justice that would oppose any huge increases in the um, judgment, uh, in the salaries of judges. But routinely, it is the Canadian Bar Association that uh, argues, appears to argue that judicial salary and pensions must be increased. So it is the CBA that takes that charge, that leads that charge to protect uh, judges in Canada. Um, I'm surprised that the MBA is not doing that, and they should. It should be one of the mandates of the Nigerian Bar Association to take on this matter. I do believe, Uche, that the judgment of um, Madam Justice Obaseki Osage was entirely consistent with international standards. It is consistent, in my view, with Article, sorry, Section 36.1 of the um, Nigerian Constitution. Uh, as, as I say, the persuasive authority for that would be the Canadian Supreme Court case that said that uh, the right to uh, meaningful uh, um, pay and pension is a matter of uh, constitutional right of citizens to an independent and um, impartial administration of justice. So I, I do think that the judgment is entirely correct. Now, briefly, you mentioned about um, uh, people complaining that this may be uh, out of uh, work. The problem there is this. Uh, that's not a new argument. But uh, in the European Court of um, Justice, I actually took up that kind of case from out of Portugal in a 2018 judgment uh, said, look, uh, the judges of uh, Tribunal de Contas, I think it, it, it was, had complained that the government of uh, Portugal was involved in a drastic economic stabilization program that cut salaries. And the judges of that tribunal said, no, you cannot cut judicial salaries too. Two, remember that? The European court said, look, no, no, that's not a violation of judicial independence because the salary was cut as a matter of uh, stable economic stabilization across the board, where salaries of uh, legislators, members of the executive, public servants, and judges were cut. So judges were not singled out in those systems. Therefore, there was no violation. Now, we have to ask ourselves, is it what's going on here? Or is it only the judges in, in Nigeria are the ones whose salaries are depleted when the pay and pension of uh, members of the other arms of government have gone up and continue to go up. I think the question to that is, the answer to that question is clear. Thank you. Thank you very much for your response. Uh, Mrs. Ojigo, uh, I want to 
I've, I've asked a follow-up question uh, to your opening intervention on access to justice. So access to justice is a major issue for many Nigerians, as you hinted in your intervention. Now, this takes many forms, uh, such as delays, costs, and complexity of the system, making it very difficult for the average Nigerian to benefit from the justice system. Many have thus resorted to self-help, as uh, was hinted by some of our panelists, to fill the vacuum. What, in your view, will be involved in any attempts at simplifying and modernizing access to justice in Nigeria? Thanks very much. Um, like you rightly noted, um, we're seeing evidence of self-help in many aspects. Uh, one horrifying one is around mob justice or mob violence as has occurred in Nigeria and across the country from the burning of the young lady Deborah um, in the north and then the young engineer in Lagos in the south. Uh, but what you find is that oftentimes those that are victims of this mob violence are people who were innocently caught in the process or people whose you know, uh, information was shared in order to settle scores. That said, we've also seen clashes between communities who are facing wide range of insecurity across the country. So lots of reprisal attacks. And the question we always ask is why are this happening? Is because people have lost confidence that the justice system will deliver justice, fairness to them, and that they're not going to be able to get any sort of closure in terms of what has happened to their loved ones or their current situation. And in the case of mob violence, we're seeing people venting their frustrations on people. Also with that understanding that the justice process is gonna take forever. Simplifying the process to make it easier for people to understand, but also in languages and in places where it's not so threatening. Um, a lot of people appreciate um, people in the entertainment industry because you know they have a way of turning things into music, into drama, into comedy, which people can relate with. So it means that for us in the um, legal sector, we need to also look at ways through which this can be bite-sized and absorbed by people um, very quickly. And then in the broader sense, to also make it easy for people to monitor these cases. You know, it can be, you know, we talked about length of cases, but one thing we, we haven't spoken about is the numerous adjournments that happen for whatever reasons. And people can understand it, you know, we've given up, taking time off work, farm, whatever, to be in court. And then we come and then they say, oh, sorry, we've adjourned or we can't attend to your case because something happened. It's so hard for uh, the public to appreciate you know, the technicalities um, and the procedural um, processes that can elongate these matters. So we should also have cases that can be fast tracked on the face of it. Um, so that people know that if there's a case of theft of a certain amount, we know that within three months, there'll be a decision. Uh, recently, during the state of emergency GBV declared by governors, and which was you know, advocated for by women's rights NGOs in Nigeria, many more, court, many more states um, are now establishing SGBV courts. And why? Because they realize that the longer it takes to prosecute um, a case involving sexual and gender-based violence, rape in particular, the harder it is for survivors of these crimes to stay on course and not lose hope in the entire process. So choosing cases that can be fast-tracked, establishing specialized um, services, language, um, investing in language services so that people can come to court and say, okay, what are they talking about? And simplifying the language we use in court will go a long way in assuring people that yes, that this is working. And they, they will not become the defenders of the process because right now people don't understand what's going on. And so they use that to justify um, whatever reprisals or fallouts that occur as a result of delayed or perceived delayed in justice. Thank you very much for your uh, response. Uh, Mrs. Alakija, uh, you have spoken about the application of technology to the work of professionals and courts. This question builds on that. 
Uh, criminal justice in Western jurisdictions have recently turned to the use of artificial intelligence to reduce justice-related delays. As research shows that AI could be a permanent part of the criminal justice ecosystem through the way it is used for investigative assistance, forensics, or helping law enforcement with prevention analytics and prediction tools for crime hotspots. Do you think there is any need for the justice sector in Nigeria to consider the use of such artificial intelligence application, especially when there are risks such as bias and discrimination or how it may undermine some fundamental human rights principles such as privacy. I mean, AI is not yet a mature technology in many of its applications, but it keeps growing globally and it seems it cannot be ignored. Should we be excited or worried? Is the use of artificial intelligence in criminal justice some form of an invasion, or is it a revolution? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for that question, or should I say those sets of questions, Rob? Um, I think, look, my short answer is this. I think that, yes, uh, Nigeria should consider the use of AI. Do I think we should be doing that now? Maybe not, because I think that there are a few steps along the way that we need to get to before we can adopt the use of AI. Uh, in your question, you mentioned uh, uh, AI for analytics and forensics. For you to successfully use AI for analytics and forensics, you have to have the underlying infrastructure. You have to have the data. Um, in advanced countries, I mean, when you watch movies, you see that, oh, there's a crime, they go and dust for fingerprints, then they check who it is. And, you know, the infrastructure that underlies all that is, first of all, you have a database of all the people in that country. You have their bio data, you have their pictures and their fingerprints. So that's the database you go to to check um, the forensic evidence that you've gathered to see who it matches. So obviously, uh, using AI to facilitate uh, justice delivery in Nigeria is a good idea, but there are a few steps that, uh, that we need to take before we get to that point. So we need to, first of all, develop the infrastructure uh, before we get to the point of deploying AI uh, to our justice delivery system. Is it an invasion or a revolution? I think it's a revolution. And like every revolution, it will come with these challenges. So there will be issues in deploying AI to our justice delivery system. And I think though that the benefits will far outweigh uh, the challenges. And you mentioned questions of discrimination and uh, violation of fundamental rights like privacy. Look, uh, profiling is something that um, law enforcement agents around the world use. Whether um, human beings will automatically profile, there's a way you look that we will decide that you have these kinds of tendencies. And that may impact how uh, you interact with the law. If you are accused of a crime, it immediately throws you in a particular light unless we're able to establish otherwise. And that's the human element. I think that machines will have the same challenge. It may review or access data or predict certain patterns that you know would, would, would miss the mark at some point. And this is where we need to actively engage with the system and continue to refine it so that we don't send people to jail that don't belong in jail simply because the algorithm missed it. In terms of data privacy, uh, again, like I said, I think that the benefits outweigh uh, the, the challenges, but uh, the key concerns around data privacy are usually how you collect that data, how long you store that data, what you use the data for, and the security of that data. Those are the primary concerns. If you're collecting data, and building a data bank that would help deliver justice in any system. I, I do not reasonably expect, for instance, that if you have a database of all Nigerians uh, uh, situated somewhere in the headquarters of the Nigerian police force, I don't expect, for instance, that they will sell that data to commercial persons who are looking to send bulk SMS to advertise. I mean, those are the kinds of violations you're looking at when you talk about data privacy. Obviously, uh, data security will be a big thing. So if we're deploying that kind of technology, we need to ensure that the systems are secure. And we're already halfway there. Whether we want to do it or not, we need that data for our day-to-day -day living. That's why we have NIN. This is why we have BBN. This is why NIMSI is collecting everybody's information and pressuring all the uh, 
the MNOs, the mobile network operators, to register all our SIM cards and connect it to our... This is the way that the whole world is going. All of us are going to come on board and put our data out there on some kind of technological platform. Using that to then promote justice in our society cannot now become the one thing that we will all say, oh no, we shouldn't do that because of data privacy. I think that we can do it within the bounds of the law and do it properly and use that to our advantage instead of against us. Thank you very much for a very uh, brilliant response. Uh, we are fast running out of time. We have a lot of questions from audience members, but unfortunately it doesn't look like we have enough time to, to uh, attend to the questions. But I think we can take one question. And this question seems to be directed at you, uh, Mrs. Alakija. Does a judge uh, making a record of proceedings not jeopardize the impartiality of the actual record? Should this not be the duty of another official who is impartial to all parties and judges? Uh, this could be resolved by having official court reporter or a technology that is under the care and control of that independent official. What do you think about this? Well, the way it is currently, the judge takes the record, the records of proceedings longhand, and then somebody transcribes it. Um, uh, so <laughs> there, it's more than one person that is involved in the process. And I think that if we deploy technology to do the same thing, it will be more than one person that will be uh, deployed to deliver the process. But again, that would be the benefit of having audio and video recordings of proceedings. I mean, we will not be reinventing the wheel here. This is what we do for arbitration and mediation, mediation proceedings. You record them and then you transcribe, or sometimes you have speech to text directly. As we're having this webinar, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you will see that it is transcribing what we're saying. So it's happening real time. And so it is possible after this meeting to look at the transcript alongside the recording, whether it's the video or the audio, and compare and then decide that these are the official transcripts for this hearing. If we do the same thing for the court system, I don't think the question of uh, whether the proceedings uh, have been, or the records have been tampered with or not will arise. But in the meantime, what we do in practice is, if you have concerns about records of proceedings, after every hearing, you apply to the court for records of proceedings so that while it is still fresh, you can look at it and you know already, sort of identify if there are any issues. It is what it is. We make do with the system that we have. Um, for now, that's what our law allows. And uh, Mr. Idibes and he did mention, you know, needing to revamp the legal framework. I think it is about time we stopped coloring outside of the lines and working with what the loopholes in the law are. And we should just, you know, update our laws and our practice, our, uh, practice directions or rules or procedures so that we'll be able to you know, improve our justice delivery. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much to all of them, um, my panelists. Uh, sadly, that's all the time we have for the first panel discussion. I would like to thank our esteemed panelists. At this time, I would like to invite our audience members to stay for what promises to be an engaging conversation about operators of Nigeria's justice system, which will be hosted by my good friend, Mr. Leke Kainde, a Nigerian legal practitioner and partner at Kende and Partners. We kindly, ask, we kindly ask for your patience as we bring in our second set of panelists. Please bear with us for a minute or so. <laughs> 